Hey, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press with Mr. Tunde Kolaole. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, my sister. How was your weekend? Fine. Thank you. That's fantastic. Let's uh, kick off uh, this morning with stories from the Nigerian Tribune. Let's see what we can quickly share with you. As many of them that make the headlines uh, this morning is going to be on your screen in a few seconds. Uh, the big one, yeah, you can see it says uh, provide train uh, soldiers with modern, uh, provide and train soldiers with modern weapons, IBB tells federal government. Also, Nigerians are starving and dying, PDP tells Buhari and APC. Why federal government isn't keen on new revenue formula? That's also on the Tribune. And um, we can also find, yeah, PDP governors converge on Ibadan today to discuss worsening insecurity and economy. Total blackout in Kaduna as labor unions begin strike. Gunmen set police station ablaze in Delta, kill DPO and two others. Yes, some wiki announces arrest of killers of security agents and Southern Houses of Assembly uh, speakers back Southern governors. Want governors to send bill to National Assembly for action. Also this morning, article to governors convene a national summit to save Nigeria. Don't wait for the federal government. Those are the big ones that we can share. Of course, uh, there's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Death toll surpasses 185 hmm. um, on the Tribune this morning. Yes, uh, moving on from the Tribune newspaper to The Guardian, we see this one saying 120 billion naira petrol subsidy to double a CBN adjust exchange rate. And the writer reads, Nigeria losing 73.6 billion naira monthly to high consumption claims despite work from home practice. Subsidy difficult to police possess, possesses major corruption risk, says LCCI. Deregulation a hard choice amid inflation, pandemic, electricity tariff hike, and that's according to a report by ProShare. World Hypertension Day. 76.2 million Nigerians are hypertensive, but only 23 million on treatment. And uh, IBB6 Nigerian supports for FG to end insecurity. Rivers in total danger, Amechi cries out. Also in the Guardian newspaper, currency printing is finance ministry's responsibility, says all. Police arrest a suspected attacker of Correctional Service Center in Oweri. Those are the stories on the Guardian newspaper. The Nation newspaper up next, uh, it says here, yeah, Jonathan O.K.'s governor's talks on national concerns. Uh, South uh, speakers back us about declaration on dialogue and others. Also, North Group uh, kicks uh, article calls for summit of governors. Feed, or rather federal support likely for states to develop ranches. Also this morning, all your PDP group snobs are up peace move, uh, peace move. And also let's back troops to end insecurity, IBB pleads. CBN plans rise pyramid for Ikiti. We can also find on the nation this morning, NLC forces cut, uh, cut off power supply, showdown in Kaduna, and also bank customers file 11.7 billion naira fraud complaints. Buhari in France for finance summit and PDP governors converge on Ibadan. Um, one or two others, three policemen killed in gunmen attack on station. And um, I think that's all we, we will be sharing on the uh, nation this morning. On the Punch newspaper, Asaba resolutions, Southern governors to meet Buhari after France trip. Aisha Yusuf, Yusufu carpets governor's critics, says nobody has monopoly of intolerance. We stand by governor's ban, Enugu Akwaibom. Killer herders don't move with cows, and that's according to MBF. Mieti Ala 6 ranching models begs Southern governors, CNG slams resolutions. Above the headlines on the Punch newspaper, $1.24 billion spent on food imports despite Forex ban. Petrol imports rose by 100 million litres in January. That's according to the NNPC. Envoy postings, union alleges fraud as foreign ministry requests 8 billion naira. APC plans 70-member committee for national convention. Seems we'll be having that national convention after all. There's a picture here that was seen on the, on the front page of the Punch newspaper, and it shows uh, people carrying someone on a stretcher and uh, many other people as well. And uh, what the caption reads uh, is, to die 
100 injured as Jerusalem Synagogue grandstand seating collapse. Copter food dropping. ACF accuses FG of conspiracy for shunning probe. National Assembly resumes. Division greets minority move against Buhari. Gumi meets Afa Afaka 37, insists on negotiation with bandits. Robbers loot Ogun warehouse, kill guard, attack policemen. ILG pose members protest as Ogun APC adopts consensus. Others. And lastly, on the Punch newspaper, Jonathan Fort, Southern Governors, uh, Southern and Northern Governors separate meetings. Those are the stories we'll take a look at this morning. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Mr. Kolawali. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's almost a week after Southern Governors met in Asaba, but there's still lots of buzz, uh, you know, about these conversations, especially with the response of um, Yeti Alakati Breeders Association. The National Secretary has been speaking. Uh, former President Good Lucky Billy Jonathan has been speaking as well. Aisha Yusufu and Southern Governors here on the Punch newspaper are built to meet the President after his trip uh, to France. So what do you think about this resolution by the Southern Governors and all the buzz it's generating? Well, uh, thank God um, the governors have finally had the courage to meet. The southern governors finally had the courage to meet in Asaba. It is something that should have happened a long time ago. Unfortunately, because uh, most of them have never developed the balls to be able to stand toe to toe, eye to eye, with their northern counterparts, they have evaded this meeting for a long time ago. But thank God it has finally come. It is better late than uh, in the late. Any reasonable Nigerian who is a king of Zaba for what has happened in the last uh, 20 years or thereabouts with regards to security in Nigeria, we definitely want to support the meeting of the governor and the resolutions that, uh, that they have um, uh, come out with. I also lend my voice so that I support it. I think uh, it's uh, one of the pathways to providing or making us uh, get security in this country. Anybody, right. any group, whoever has ideas to contribute that is going to lead to the stability of this country, that is going to give us peace and security so that our people can go about their normal lives as they used to do before we do, I mean, before this democratic dispensation. It's a welcome development. But unfortunately, I have read the resolution, the most jamming, the most important, mm -hmm. that the governors have, should have put on the agenda of that they are meeting, of their demands. They have not done it. And what are these jamming issues? One of it is um, the secularity of the Nigerian state. Nigeria, when you look at our constitution, is supposed to be a secular state. But a section of the country, especially the far north, the northeast, the northwest, uh, and then the, 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 the state bordering in Jay and Chad, uh, Samfara and Jigawa and all of that, especially all those of who have adopted the Sharia system of law, have not subscribed to the secularity of the Nigerian state. They are practicing Sharia, they are arresting, trying people, and convicting them and sentencing them to death for blasphemy, for adultery, and no manners of uh, things. They still have in their Sharia statute books and uh, the law that allows criminals, or especially thieves, uh, for the hands of thieves to be amputated. Those are still in the statute books of uh, some of these states that I've mentioned. We cannot have a peaceful Nigeria until the northern Nigerian elite are subscribed to the secularity of the Nigerian state. It is at the bottom of the crisis that we have in today. If every section of the country succumb to the secularity of the Nigerian state, we will all be speaking with one voice. We will all be fighting on the same line. We will all be confronting the Boko Haram insurgency and the other Islamic fundamentalists with a single mind, with a determined purpose. I would have been able to defeat that um, jihadist movement a long time ago. But because a section of the country have not succumbed, have been subscribed, to the secularity of the Nigerian state, we are not confronting that war the way it should be confronted. Right. The other one is this. When a man is pointing an accusing finger at uh, somebody else, 
Four of the five fingers in his hands are probably pointing at him. The governor themselves, apart and parcel of the insecurity challenges mm. that we have in the country, what, like I said earlier on, before they return to this uh, civil war, we didn't have this high level of insecurity in Nigeria. Yes, there were armed robberies, there were muggings, there were burglaries and all that, but not at the level at which we do have it today. What has happened between the transition from military rule to this civil rule that we now have this high level of insecurity? The truth of the matter is there is hardly any governor in this country today, there is hardly any politician in this country today that does not have a private army, that does not have a military group behind them. In fact, their belief is that without a private army and military group, you cannot win any election in this country. Recall one of the southern governors. It is the butcher in Akusu, the head of SARS in Akusu, who butchers people and throws tens of bodies into the rivers and all that. That was the chief security officer of this governor. You can also cast your mind back to what happened during the NSA. Also look at what Akele Dolu, I mean Akele Dolu, the governor of Ondo State, was doing to Hitai Ojegede during the last campaign. Look at what happened during the last PDP Congress in um, position of Shun State and all that. Also look at what is happening in the PDP Congress in Kaduna today. So the governors are also at the bottom of the insecurity that we have. All right, so um, the most Mr. Kola Ole. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, uh, uh, moving on, I, I want you to also react to uh, Matiko Abubakar's uh, views. He's saying that um, he wants all Nigerian governors to convene a national summit uh, to save Nigeria and not wait for the federal government. Um, according to him, you know, you, you, when you can't clap with one hand or when you clap with, with uh, one hand, it doesn't have that much effect. But if you have uh, two hands clapping, um, then, of course, you, you would make a louder noise. So... Uh, do you agree with, you know, his views and should all Nigerian governors, not just northern or southern governors now, should all Nigerian governors convene by themselves and have a resolution? Yes, yeah, uh, honestly speaking, just like I earlier on said, whatever is going to bring us security in this country, I don't care who is saying it or from what quarter is coming from, mm. whether it be Atiku or any other person. It is a welcome development for me. But you know my position on my view on Atiku, that we cannot go and hang out or stay in Dubai and then be making prognosis or providing solutions to Nigeria problem. This should come back home and be part and parcel of the peace building process. But with that as it may, I doubt it whether both the northern governors and the southern governors will ever speak with the same voice. If you have been listening and hearing the communiques that have been coming from the northern governors, and the position that has now been taken by the southern governor, you will see or you will find that they are dramatically opposed. The northern governor still believes that the full and near other, the capital era, should be allowed to roam around the way they have always done. They also still will not subscribe to the secularity of the Nigerian state. They also have this mentality that the northern people are superior to the southern people and that they are probably born to rule Nigeria and that the Nigerian nation is uh, their patrimony, which they can do whatever they wish with and all that. So if a group of people have that kind of a mindset, and the Sanders governor also has this slave mentality, it will be difficult for them to have a middle ground, for them to be able to arrive at a consensus that is going to move the Nigerian forward. But be that as it may, don't let us discount what Atiku has suggested. Let's give it a try and see what comes out of it. All right, and the Nigerian Tribune and other newspapers, we, we saw the story recurring, and it's IBB telling the federal government to train soldiers and provide them with modern weapons. On the nation, it reads, thus, let's back troops to end insecurity. Obviously, we know that security has been, you know, one of the burning issues in Nigeria today, and uh, from different quarters has been different suggestions. But what do you think of IBBs here to back troops and, of course, to train them, give them more weapons? <laughs> it, is, uh, it is good to note that the IBB, the Maradona, uh, and also sometimes described as uh, the evil genius, is still alive and kicking. He is an elder statesman. He's been there before as a military head of state for about eight years. So when he speaks, we shouldn't discountenance uh, what he has said. His uh, suggestions are also 
ema umbulo kina, a welcome uh, uh, development. But I have my reservations with uh, that uh, suggestion. So the essence that uh, I am one of those who believe, just like Pastor Igodano, and just like uh, Ogunza Misi, the former secretary of the OPC, uh, have always said that our security people have become part and parcel of the problems. And I will give you two examples. Not too long ago, a trailer carrying arms and ammunition traveled to the northern part of the country fell somewhere. And what was discovered inside that trailer? They were cargoes of death, bullets, arms, and ammunition. And that trailer has transited from one state to the other before it finally had an accident. As it did get passed by, the truth of the matter is that when you do your investigations critically, you find out when people are very, you know, carrying the cargoes of death from one point to the other, what they will usually do is to hire either a soldier, hire a policeman, hire a customer, and then use them as escorts to take those weapons or cargoes of death from one point um, to the other. They will also prepare fake papers to deceive uh, security men who may have been mounting roadblocks that these cargoes of death are probably meant for some police formation or for some army formations and war have And because of that, uh, equipping without reorganizing the Nigerian army is uh, never going to give us uh, peace. In fact, it's going to be counter uh, uh, productive. Furthermore, while I do recognize the sacrifices of the Nigerian soldiers, of the Nigerian police, of the Nigerian Air Force, of the Nigerian customs and migration, the patriotic ones among them, you and I will still remember there are a lot of bad eggs among them. Not too long ago, a serving military man uh, was arrested in one of the motor parks in the north with uh, boxes full of uh, bullets, which he was carrying from one place to the other. He also prepared very fake papers to be able to transport this uh, cargo of death to wherever he was taking them to. Thank God, the motor, the National Union of Road Transport Workers was vigilant. They saw or discovered what he was carrying, and then they alerted the security man, and he was arrested. I've also talked about this other one before. There is indiscipline in the Nigerian army. A lot of indiscipline in the Nigerian army. And that the Nigerian army has been infiltrated by the Islamic fundamentalists, by the Boko Haram, by the Iswas, and also by the, I mean, by the Nigerian politicians who have been using them for nefarious activities. If you harm such persons, the way Amana IDP is recommending, the possibility is that as soon as you provide them brand new, modern hardware, they will donate such hardware to the Islamic fundamentalists that like we have seen in the past. And then uh, those hardware will become weapons that is going to be used against the Nigerian army and against the Nigerian people. In fact, what some of these soldiers have been doing is donating their weapons to the Islamic fundamentalists, which at the end of the day are used against, them, uh, against their own brothers and sisters. To me, this is high treason, and it is something that we have to look at before we begin to arm, provide, and give further training to the Nigerian army. Well, the now. discipline in the Nigerian army must first and foremost be withered out. It must be uprooted. We must organize the Nigerian army to become a patriotic army, and an army that has the board to really confront Islamic fundamentalists, oh. other security men, muggers, and all manners of uh, merchants uh, of death who are traversing the Nigerian nation. All right. Well, th those are, of course, I think we'll just have to quickly note that those are still, you know, allegations. There's not been 100% proof of, Absolutely. Uh, of the army. But they're in the public weapons. domain, which has not been denied. Well, we would we'll, uh, leave it as allegations and um, conspiracy theories. Um, there's also something on security that I'd like you to quickly also speak on. It's another Monday and yet another day in the news where we are seeing uh, reports of gunmen attacking police stations. This one happened in Delta. Uh, led to the death of a DPO, and I think the nation also carries something similar, about three policemen killed um, in attacks on police stations once again. Um, your reaction to that, and you know, what do you think you know, is going on in southern Nigeria with attacks on police offices, and of course, the INEC office is also being burnt? Honestly speaking, when a policeman is killed, when a soldier is killed, 
when a custom man is killed, when the civil defense man is killed, I feel for them. They are women beings who are entitled to their life. They are women beings who have wives, who have children, who have relations, and other dependents whose survivor will be at jeopardy when they are killed in the manner in which they are being killed. And so it is very, very unfortunate. Sometimes, too, innocent people like suspects in those police stations, other people may have come to those police stations to transact some businesses and all that. And also, uh, sometimes, casualties of some of these uh, attacks. And to that extent, it should be something that we should all not encourage. This is something that we should condemn. But then, we must look at the roots of all these uh, attacks in the Southeast. It would appear to me that certain organizations, that certain people, that certain forces are trying to weaken the coercive apparatus of the state. And you and I do know that the police is one or the first and foremost coercive apparatus of the state. So that they want to weaken it, they want to debilitate it, they want to cripple it before maybe embarking on something that is bigger than what we are saying uh, with regards to the police station now. It is for us as a nation to identify these people and know what their grievances are and negotiate with them. If we have been paying ransoms to bandits and kidnappers, if we have been paying ransom to Boko Harams and giving them amnesty, there is nothing wrong whatsoever. If we are able to identify those who are attacking police stations in the South, South and the Southeast, and we bring them to the negotiation table and then they find an amicable solution to this. Anywhere you have had a war, whether civil or external, at the end of the day, you always still have to sit at the round table to find solutions to some of these problems. I sympathize with the people of the Southeast. I sympathize with the, people, the Nigerian police. I sympathize with all those who are the receiving end of this mayhem that is taking place in the Southeast. But with that as it may, let's get to the root of it and find solutions to it that will be peaceful, amicable, and that will be pleasing to both sides uh, of the divide. Certain forces are agreed, and it is for us to look at, find out what their grievances are, and address those grievances. All right. So when we look at the uh, newspapers this morning, many other stories that we see, you know, away from the issue of security is politics, really. And uh, we know that here on The Nation is talking about the Oyo PDP group snobbing the Arapajas peace move and the party chief saying he'll push on. Also, we know um, there's the conference that almost held in uh, Oyo State over the weekend with Sunday Buho there and all the other <coughs> issues that occurred with that. And we know also that uh, from what we've seen, there's been a move for the Odua People's Congress, you know, in Nigeria. What are your thoughts regarding that, all those, these political issues ahead of the election in Nigeria with several states clamoring for uh, self-independence? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> when you look at the United Nations uh, uh, Charter, you also look uh, very deeply at the African Charter. And if you also look at the Nigerian constitution and all that, uh, you could see that there is no law that says that people, when they are grieved, or if they feel cheated, or if they feel maltreated, or if they are never feeling comfortable again within a particular nation or geographical boundary, they could not ask for self-determination. Uh, to that extent, uh, we should give it to the self-determination group that uh, it is their right to agitate for self-determination. What the Nigerian nation requires to do, like I've always said, is for the nation like civilized people or a civilized group of uh, people to conduct a referendum and see whether majority of people within that particular region uh, want uh, self-determination. If through a referendum they win, then you let them go. And if they are defeated, they will keep their mouth uh, shut. Uh, but with that as it may, with regards to 2003 election, uh, even without uh, Sunday go or anybody saying it, it is going to be difficult for us to organize uh, the 2023 election with the high level of insecurity mm -hmm. that we have all over the place. We must address this security force before we can be talking about 2023 election. With regards to Sunday go, let me raise this alarm and uh, caution the Nigerian people. Anybody who have studied the history of self-determination 
all over the world struggle for independence, who know that uh, people like Sunday go do, don't make good freedom fighters. They don't. People have uh, idiot past. People have criminal tendencies and all that. They don't make good soldiers. They don't make good freedom fighters. Most times, they enlist into the freedom struggle or into the self-determination army to be able to cover up their idiot past. And as soon as they are brought into the, into the freedom struggle and all that, they use it to punish the, 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 the dirty image that they have had in the past. And as soon as they settle in, they will continue their nefarious activities, their criminal tendencies and all that. It is for that reason that all over the world, people with uh, criminal tendencies are never allowed to lead a self-determination group or allowed or ever conscripted into self-determination army. They will pollute the freedom struggle. They will pollute the freedom army. And they will mess up the whole entire structure. And uh, this is the second time the Yoruba people will be making this mistake. You will remember that during the struggle for the Abiola, the revalidation of Abiola's uh, a mandate. So we also saw it. It was a 70-year-old 70, 70 man, 80-year-old man, Abraham Adesoya, Olani Chahir, and all the rest of them that were leading the struggle for the revalidation of uh, Abiola's uh, a mandate. 70, 80 years of Togeneria don't do the revolution. It is only in Yoruba land that I saw that for the first time. Mm -hmm. The brightest of our people, unfortunately people like Inka Utumaki is dead now, it is people like that who should be leading the kind of crusade that Sande Bobo is uh, leading today and not a man like Sande Bobo who has an odious past, who ordinarily should be answering questions in certain quarters for some of the activities and the things he has done in the past. All right. To Nicola Wally, thank you so much for starting our week with, uh, with us and, of course, uh, for your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So we can't wait to go back uh, to the year uh, 20, I beg your pardon, 1953 and 1954 to bring you two major events that shaped the history of Nigeria and the United States. Do stay with us.